organized in partnership with Drossos Foundation, Elefsis 2023, uh, Zukak Theatre Company, Artlink, and supported by Creative Europe. We are here uh, with 26 participants coming from different countries in MENA, Balkan, and Mediterranean. Uh, we have a panel today on the challenges and possibilities of international and regional cultural collaboration with Rania Kawani from the Amman Contemporary Dance Festival in Jordan, with Christos Karas from the Omasis Foundation and with Carol Gertler from Drossos Foundation. We are delighted to have you with us. The panel is facilitated by Mike van Graan and I will hand the floor to him now uh, to start the conversation. Thank you very much, Inge. And as Inge has said, today we are dealing with the challenges, but also the possibilities of collaborating in the arts and culture space, both at a regional level, but internationally as well. And this is obviously a particular challenge at this time. Most of us have been in lockdown for more than 10 months, and the pandemic has had a pretty devastating impact on the art sector and on festival making. So this is a particularly important panel in terms of talking possibly about the um, ideas that have emerged over the last 10 months that artists are implementing in our different countries, in the region, but also maybe learning from other parts of the world. So we're delighted to have the three speakers um, with us and the order in which we're going to be doing this is Christos will go first. He has a PowerPoint that he has to present to us and then he'll be followed by Carol and Rania, whom we met yesterday will be bringing up the rear, as they say. So after they have each presented, there'll be a little bit of a facilitated conversation and then obviously over to the uh, participants to be able to ask questions and make comments on the basis of the presentations too. Christos, welcome. Uh, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Mike and uh, Inge and everyone for organizing this. Um, I'll try and share my screen if that's uh, possible. Yep, it seems to be working. Um, can you all see a black <laughs> slide? Yeah? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, so, um, I'm going to do a, a brief uh, a run through of a little bit of background about what the Onassis Foundation is and what we do, especially in relation uh, to the Mediterranean, the uh, MENA area, and then uh, with some examples of collaborations and networks and what have you, uh, and then finish uh, with some ideas uh, that might be sort of uh, relevant, uh, I hope, uh, to, the, uh, to the participants, bearing in mind, of course, that the organization that I'm representing, the Onassis Foundation, is obviously a fairly big organization uh, with uh, extensive facilities. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, the, the kind of things that we do are obviously not in the same kind of uh, 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 area as most of the projects that, uh, that, that you have been discussing. Uh, I'm very well aware of this. So what I'm going to try and do is at the end, extract a few uh, ideas from our, our own practice that I think might be uh, relevant. And I'd like to say that it was very, very helpful to read through the, uh, the booklet with all the, uh, the questionnaires that the people have uh, uh, submitted. I thought it was extremely interesting and it actually helped me a lot to understand more about the, uh, the, the context. So thank you very much for, for sharing that with me. Um, uh, Onassis Stehi, or the Onassis Cultural Center, as we used to be known, is a, uh, uh, a part of the Onassis Foundation. The Onassis Foundation itself has three basic areas of activity, health, education, and culture, and we are obviously part of the cultural pillar, as we say, along with some other um, divisions, such as the Artists in Residence program, which maybe some of you have heard of uh, as well. We're a transdisciplinary space. In other words, uh, we don't work in any one particular art form, but across the art forms uh, with very much an emphasis on hybridity. Um, and we have uh, a building, as you can see here, with two amphitheaters, one larger, one smaller, some peripheral facilities around, around town. And we often do things in public space. I mean, we feel very much uh, in favor of going out of our building uh, because our program is actually often quite uh, mm -hmm. challenging and engaging, but our building is sometimes for some of the people we want to actually come into contact with a bit formal and off-putting. So we do a lot of work in, in, in public spaces. We have a, a significant international presence as I'll uh, discuss a bit later. And obviously 
our online footprint has grown enormously over the past year. This is obviously one of the conclusions of our experience. Uh, I'll come to that later uh, as well. And of course, as part of the foundation, uh, we try and stay close to what is the mission of the foundation, uh, which is going to be a stimulating force for shifting ideas and hopefully practices uh, in the world around us. Some of the key aspects of, of our work we produce, um, in other words, we're one of the principal production houses in Greece. Uh, we off, one of our primary roles is to take new productions uh, proposed to us through open calls usually um, and provide all the technical and financial support that's necessary to get them to the, uh, um, uh, to the stage and to the public or whatever it is, the medium that they're producing in. We also provide support for artists to develop ideas at a previous phase before actually reaching production. And we also, of course, invite artists from abroad uh, or in various forms to, to present work in our, in our spaces. Um, we have, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, presentation facilities in the spaces. We're very active in the public space and we're also quite active in exporting, to use that sense. In other words, in supporting the, uh, uh, the, the efforts made uh, by artists based in Greece uh, to actually tour outside. I mean, Greece is obviously within Europe, but it's a fairly peripheral country in Europe. It's not easy for young artists in Greece to tour outside Greece. And one of our primary functions is to actually actually enable this through a program that we've developed uh, for this for this purpose. We're also very active broadcasters. Uh, uh, on the left, you can see a little bit of what's on our channel at the moment uh, on YouTube. Um, we, we use YouTube, we use Vimeo, we've set up a radio program called Movement Radio, which I recommend you take a listen to because it has a lot of work from around the Mediterranean. It's its primary focus actually is the movement of people, ideas, sounds, cultures uh, through the Mediterranean and, and beyond. So please take a listen uh, to that. Obviously, broadcasting has become uh, an essential part of what we've been doing for the past uh, years, the past year, although we were doing it before as well. There's been a tremendous acceleration. And I think we've all learned a lot about what this means in terms of production as well. We learned very quickly, and I'm sure everyone has learned this too, that actually having a, a good YouTube channel does not consist of just uploading what you have. You have to actually rethink through the formats of what you're producing in order to make it interesting uh, and stimulating as something to be seen through this accursed screen that we've been condemned to uh, for so many months now. So one of the first learnings is that the internet is a medium uh, and that this medium requires thinking about forms. Uh, so that's, I think, an important, uh, an important takeaway that we've all uh, we've all had. We're quite strong at communicating uh, and taking, taking uh, positions in the public sphere. We believe that as a cultural organization, it's something that we should do. Uh, we regularly come out and say what we believe about important things that are, that are happening in the world uh, around us and initiatives that do this. Um, we're very networked, I'll come to that in a while. And we're also uh, very um, interested and active in the field of digital innovation. Uh, this can mean either working at the level of new uh, production, new production modes that incorporate um, uh, digital technologies, increasingly things that involve machine learning as well. It can also involve how we do our own work internally through using these digital tools uh, in a more conscious way within our organization. Finally, but not least, um, we're, we're actively engaged uh, in a program to make our operation more environmentally sustainable. Uh, we've just completed the first three year program with Julie's Bicycle from the UK, uh, and we're working towards our goal of becoming uh, carbon neutral as quickly as possible. I won't put a date on it because it's difficult to, to establish this, but certainly we're making good progress in that, in, in that dimension. On to some of the international collaborations with an emphasis on our region uh, here. Just some examples, because obviously over the 10 years, nearly 11 now that we've been active, we've done a lot more than this, uh, but just to give you some ideas of things that we do. A first example was uh, from quite early on in our activity was our participation in hosting Meeting Point 6. I'm sure most of you know 
uh, meeting points, obviously. Uh, so this was a very interesting experience for us, really uh, um, a way deep in, a deep dive into what was happening in contemporary performing arts uh, around, the, around the Mediterranean, around the South Mediterranean, the Middle East. A very good opportunity for us to be involved uh, in, in all this. You can see some of the names who were invited there. And we, this particular edition was curated by the great uh, late Okwi Enwezor, which was also uh, su superbly interesting to have him with us uh, for, for various talks. So one of the things that we do is engage through existing formats uh, and structures uh, in, in, in various regions. Following meeting points, we did similar activities uh, with at least three other areas of the world, Central Europe, Middle East, and the Balkans. So this is a format that was, uh, that was very good for us. We co-produce uh, a lot. Again, just one example from the uh, uh, again from the Middle East uh, uh, region. Um, you can see here the uh, the, the sort of co-producers that we were uh, involved with. This is something that we do uh, a lot, and it's a, obviously we all know one of the main ways in which productions actually get done uh, these days is building up networks of co-producers, uh, and we've actually know over the years have a core group of people that we do work with regularly. At this immensely facilitates the development of new work and of course ensures its, uh, its touring. A second uh, level at which we've uh, been active in collaborating uh, has been focusing on uh, particular places. One of these has been uh, Beirut uh, and uh, over the years uh, we've been very active in developing projects in collaboration with artists based in Beirut but also institutions based in Beirut like the uh, Beirut Arts Residency for example where we've exchanged residency programs uh, over the years. Um, this was uh, uh, it is, this is an area of collaboration that's ongoing with various degrees of intensity. Obviously, right now, Beirut is uh, going through, as you know much better than I do, a particularly critical uh, phase, uh, and it's a lot of people have moved out or going, coming and going, uh, but we still work very closely uh, with artists there. For example, over the next months, we hope to be able to host um, a performance lecture by Ziad Antar, for, for example. More specifically in Beirut, uh, over the past two years, unfortunately last year it was cancelled, uh, we've developed a partnership with Irtijal Festival. Irtijal Festival, as many of you know, uh, is an experimental music festival that's been going in Beirut for, I think, 20 years now, uh, through thick and thin. Um, well done to, uh, to them, it's quite an achievement. On our side, we have a, also an experimental music festival called Borderline. There's a really good synergy in terms of programming. Uh, so what we did was develop actually a common program to a very large degree uh, in 2019, and we hope again uh, in, the next, uh, in the next editions to be able to continue this, which involved both creating new uh, productions of artists from Greece and Lebanon working together, but also facilitating the touring of artists between the two festivals. Uh, and this has led to various ideas of how we could be active in the region in this way. For example, we've also been in discussion with a very interesting festival called Space 21, which is in uh, Estimani in, uh, in Iraqi Kurdistan. So another form of more, let's say, deep partnership with, uh, with organizations. The third level I'd like to touch upon uh, is the European uh, level. We're super active um, at, in the area of European networks and collaborations, obviously to a very large degree Creative Europe, uh, but also Erasmus Plus in the past, FP7 and Horizon uh, 2020 also. Um, at the beginning of the year, we were actually partners in about 10 European networks with various uh, areas of interest. So I'll just mention two of these European networks that I think are interesting. One was Interfaces, which was a large scale uh, collaboration project that we were coordinating. I think it was one of the first large scale projects to be coordinated by an institution in, in Greece, which was about uh, new sonic art and how to bring it to wider, uh, wider publics. There's a very interesting repository of materials from that project, which is now closed, which you can see at uh, interfacesnetwork.eu uh, if you're interested. The second was uh, is Sounds Now. Sounds Now is a project that aims to to broaden, uh, let's say, the field of curation in uh, new music. Again, it's a sound based uh, uh, project. Uh, to sort of break out of the little bubble uh, that often characterizes what uh, our new music festivals are like in, in, in Europe. 
uh, and within this uh, uh, project, we have uh, several um, sub projects which also involve uh, um, uh, artists from Beirut and from Cairo uh, also. So one of the things the project is trying to do is to make it much broader in terms of its geographic uh, outreach as well. So this is also a Creative Europe project. And last but not least, a project that's also just starting now, um, Alexandria, led by Musem in uh, Marseille, um, in which our role is to uh, run a series of uh, um, sonic urban research residencies in Marseille, Athens and Alexandria. So again, although these European projects are obviously very European centered, um, according to the, the focus that the partners want to give, there is a way uh, to bring in um, institutions and actors from around the Mediterranean outside the European Union. And this is obviously one very interesting uh, thing. Just closing with one other um, um, international collaboration, just because it indicates a different funding framework, uh, which is our collaboration with Ultima Contemporary Music Festival in Norway. Uh, this is a collaboration funded by the EEA grant, the European Economic Area Grant. Um, maybe you, you probably already all know this, uh, but the EEA is also quite active in the Mediterranean region. So just this to say that obviously Europe and the European Commission is a, a primary source, but one has to look beyond that as well. Um, so coming to just some, some thoughts uh, in, in closing uh, about, uh, about uh, you know, what may be transferable uh, within, uh, within this discussion that we're having here today. Um, as I said in the beginning, I think the challenges are very, very well expressed by the participants and, and you know I, um, obviously there's some some challenges that are very region specific i mean a lot of you mentioned political stability uh, a lot of you mentioned uh, the fact that contemporary art is often even more marginalized within society than it is uh, in europe and no doubt these are indeed factors uh, that are more more complicated to manage in uh, in in areas outside Europe uh, than within. On the other hand, uh, it's just good to remember that for many European organizations, some of the problems that you mentioned, especially for smaller organizations, the problems are very similar. A lot of you mentioned capacity building and professionalism and the dependence on voluntary work. Uh, that's something that's actually quite common to a lot of European or smaller organizations. So it's not as though um, people have resolved this within Europe uh, as, as well. Um, just to bear that in mind. The first thing from related to what I mentioned earlier about the European networks is that obviously EU projects are quite heavy in terms of administration, in terms of the processes for submit, submitting uh, and actually managing many of these pro projects. It's also difficult, I think, uh, actually to, to, to be able to get into them, uh, especially as a smaller organization. And in this sense, one of the tactics uh, that I think is useful is working with larger organizations uh, in sub projects as associated partners um, in order to, to find your way through uh, this bureaucracy into actual collaborating a collaboration framework. I think that's probably a good way uh, uh, to go, possibly the only way to go, uh, in, in fact, to try and develop and produce uh, um, uh, sub projects within a larger European project building on relationships that exist within the European Union that you might have been developing uh, over time. Um, second thing I'd like to stress and something that I think has become very obvious to all of us, uh, especially during this pandemic phase, uh, when, when things became very precarious for many organizations, uh, is the importance of building up a local, a local base. Uh, it's, it's very important, obviously, to also reach out beyond uh, and beyond the region even, but at the end of the day, um, organizations that are resilient are organizations that actually have a strong local base. Um, which can provide support at moments of crisis, uh, which can provide ways to influence uh, local stakeholders uh, beyond the organization's reach. I think this is very, very important. It's, it's important to look beyond, but it's very important not to forget the significance of local base, uh, support base for the resilience of an organization. Another point uh, has to do with uh, uh, with what we've all been doing uh, over the past uh, uh, the past months, which is putting a lot of stuff online. Um, I think it's very important to work 
uh, at at this in as professional a way as possible. And these are the two these two points uh, together. Uh, both the clarity and usefulness of the online communication. I mean, there's so much stuff out there that it has to be clear to someone uh, what 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 it's about what they can get in terms of information and feedback so this the structure of the online presence is extremely important and it is unfortunately also important to get professional advice in terms of social media and search engine optimization there's just so much out there and it doesn't necessarily require an immense investment but if there is any communications budget available i really would recommend uh, allocating some of it uh, to working with professionals in terms of social media uh, and search engine optimization, it does it does unfortunately uh, uh, pay off, um, uh, you know, because otherwise it's very difficult to get any visibility uh, at all. Speaking of visibility. Obviously, events like this and many others that you can participate with are important. And visibility, I think, is a is one of the things that one can try and benefit from the actual situation when we're all zooming. I mean, it's been very hard to do things physically, but over the past few months, actually, I think we've been more connected than we have been uh, before in terms of actually being in contact with other people, not in the way we'd like, but nonetheless. So being visible, being there, being present, being active in, in forums that are relevant uh, is something that's doable and, and relevant, uh, I think. Thinking through the formats of what we do, as I said earlier, um, it's the, the internet, which we're condemned to working through at the moment, uh, the screen, requires us to think about the form of what we're doing. Uh, it's just to put online stuff that's been done for a stage. It doesn't usually work. So it's you have to think about the actual formal implications of, of the of, of the screen. And lastly, and to my opinion, quite importantly, is thinking of different types of uh, synergies. I mean, the art world is what it is, uh, but it's limited, uh, especially in the more experimental uh, aspects of it. But there are many other areas which are often very interested in collaboration with arts organizations and which might also tie in with the idea of local uh, uh, collaborations as well. They could be education institutions, schools or higher education, research institutes, the connection of research, science and art is an extremely hot topic uh, at the moment. Um, heritage organizations, obviously important uh, in, in the region in which we are, and even potentially some forms of tourist, uh, uh, tourist uh, uh, industry as well, are sources perhaps of, uh, of synergies that can be beneficial to, to organizations working at a local level. Anyway, those are just some some initial thoughts from me. Thank you very much for listening and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much. Christoph. That is a fantastic opening to this panel and thank you particularly for the wonderful ideas at the end. Um, as I was saying earlier on, yesterday was very much about articulating the challenges that we face and if there's anything that we've been encountering over the last 10 months has been challenges. So great to have some optimistic views and ideas and points at the end. Carol, let's look forward to listening to Carol now. So just let's make me the, the camera. Good morning. Thank you very much. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. I remember the last year when I was here, but two years ago, it was a very dynamic uh, atelier. So I'm really happy to be here and also to see a few partners of Process Foundation. Um, just maybe what struck me out of Christoph's beautiful presentation was that you mentioned in the mission, it was like seek ideas and ignite discussions. And I think that is already says a lot about why we should collaborate. Um, and uh, you will also see that I'm an absolutely fan of collaboration. I actually think that there is not an option, but there's a need for collaborations. Uh, I think we have to leverage impact, reduce resources, and also to respond to the many global needs, collaboration is, as I said, a need and not an option anymore. And I also do think that collaboration should go across sectors and borders, uh, that it gives a lot of opportunities now for new methodologies uh, and new ways to do that. I'm not thinking just of, of let's say, the virtuality and, and online. Um, and uh, I will, talk a little bit about the three elements of collaboration that I consider relevant 
uh, focus structure and composition. But maybe just um, a few words about Rosa's Foundation, um, also to see why we uh, promote collaboration. Rosa's Foundation is a private a Swiss-based foundation. We work in Switzerland and Germany, but mainly in the MENA region. So we have an office in Egypt, we have an office in, in Palestine and one in Casablanca. And we are active obviously in Egypt, Morocco, Palestine, but also in Jordan, Lebanon and Tunisia. And uh, we are, uh, we focus, let's say on two areas of interventions. One is uh, promote and support economic development that includes job creation, access to the labor market, vocational training, business support, entrepreneurship. Uh, and the other one is the development of creative skills, uh, engaging youth in creativity, supporting arts uh, practitioners, um, establishing supporting art spaces, just access to culture and arts and showcasing also the economic value of arts and the relevance of art for, let's say, a wealthy, a, let's say, a healthy and uh, the well-being of the society. And because also we have these two, uh, let's say, areas of intervention, which is a little bit the economic aspect as well, the arts and culture, you will also realize that I advocate very much for crossing sectors also uh, when collaborat collaborating. Um, I would also like to talk a little bit about the opportunities that collaboration brings and maybe even now after, let's say, facing this year, months with COVID and other challenges in the world. Um, I think it's a good time also to really rethink the three factors of collaboration that are, as I said, focus, structure and composition. Um, it gives us, a, when I speak about focus, then it's mainly about really thinking, is this collaboration relevant to my work? How can I show and present my work? And the other aspect is a bit, um, is it relevant and particularly relevant for me um, as it gives me the opportunity to meet others? Um, when I speak of, of work, because it will leverage my impact in the sense of outreach audience, it will give me new opportunities, uh, it strengthen my reputation and at the end, that supports the sustainability. Um, and when I speak of meeting others, then it really says a bit what is in also in the mission of uh, the Onassis Foundation is seek ideas, develop experience, increase quality at the end, because the benchmark you have to, to uh, face others uh, and it's learning from peers. Um, and at the end, it's also bringing new ideas for collaboration. So at the end, it's the question is, what is meaningful when we collaborate? I think that should be the start of any collaboration. And in particular, nowadays, we should ask and have this opportunity to really ask again, what kind of collaborations are meaningful? And may maybe also to think out of the box as we did in the past. The other aspect is structure. When we look at collaboration, we look at the structure of a collaboration, and that includes obviously um, coming from one idea, but then having a common goal. Uh, the governments, how is a collaboration governed? Uh, I'm not saying that there is one model, but I think depending on the, on the goal, depending on what I would like to have from this uh, collaboration, it very much depends on the governments. Then how do I keep it alive? How do I activate, activate it? How do I uh, engage stakeholders, others that are not my, maybe my closest counterparts, but how do I engage communities? Um, the development of such a co collaboration should not be stagnant. There should be continuous progress. So how do we go forward? How, what are the milestones? And then mobility. Um, and I think that's in particular today interesting, although we know that travel restrictions have, uh, we face travel restrictions also in the past, but I think in particular now with COVID and with the environmental challenges that we face on a global level, mobility um, is, is a topic. And I think there are also new ideas for coming together uh, in a virtual, let's say. Uh, the third aspect is, is composition, and here it's really about the level of diversity. I think diversity is a very precious good that needs to be taken care of uh, very cautiously. And um, we also heard it from Christos, 
um, I think a, a good organization has a strong local base. So maybe also collaboration doesn't have to be always big and across, uh, let's say, many, involve many partners or many um, countries, but it can also be on a local level uh, with communities and, and uh, the, the stakeholders that are there. What I would really advocate is the crossing sectors, uh, in particular for the culture and art sector. Um, it's a sector that is quite a bubble. And I do think that it inspires and it's a need for breaking the, 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 the borders of the cultural sector and to look outside of this sector and, and start new collaborations with the private sector, not just also with the public, but in particular also with the private sector and um, other actors that could be interesting. The re region in the sense of geographical outreach is also something that we kind of question again, because it was a bit, in our view, very focused on Western European collaborations and partnerships, understandable because the art sector, let's say, in Western Europe is very institutionalized, it's highly specialized and developed, there, is a, there are public resources, there is a dynamic market and the good network. But uh, I do also think that it's time to look outside of the Western, uh, of Western Europe and in particular, and I'm happy to see here also a lot of uh, participants uh, to the Balkans, to Latin America and within the MENA region. There are many more opportunities that we might think and maybe to shift a little bit to focus of also the, the geographic areas where we like to collaborate could be an inspiration and very useful. I would like to give you maybe uh, two or three examples of collaboration of the Drosus Foundation um, to see also the variety of possibilities to collaborate. Uh, one is just lately the Solidarity Fund in, in Lebanon. Uh, we heard about the situation in, in Lebanon and it was uh, within one or two months that two implementing organizations like Afonk and Maurad, as well as three donors organization, the Open Society, Ford Foundation and Drosus Foundation came kind of together and had the idea to establish a solidarity fund to strengthen organizations uh, to survive um, and kind of have the opportunity to rethink a little bit their organization. Um, and such, I think that's a wonderful example. It was the focus was really much on an emergency aid. The structure was led by the two implementing organizations, very simple, very hierarchical. Um, and uh, the composition was in the sense uh, not so diverse, but we had kind of the, the donors and we had the implementing organization, uh, but it was a very efficient, let's say, collaboration. And I think um, it may had a huge impact alone. No one would be able to do that alone. And it had a, also a huge visibility because all of us could bring in our network and um, it's a collaboration that continues now, even without the organizations, uh, at least without the donors' organizations. Another one is not focusing on the art sector, but it's the Mediterranean Nouvelle Chance, that is a network of uh, more than uh, of dozens, let's say more than 50 organizations. It's a mix of uh, NPOs, um, institutes, educational institutes, and companies private sector representatives to promote and support kind of the second, second school education in the Mediterranean vocational training. And the goal of the network is really to advocate and to promote this kind of education for people who have rather challenges to access the regular let's say, educational system um, and also to give ideas to, to each other. And we see there a lot of um, inspiration in the sense of peer-to-peer -peer learning, so Portugal and Morocco collaborating, um, visiting each other, and because there is a very similar it's a background, similar um, or the resources, similar goals, it's a very fruitful collaboration between these partners. And the last one maybe I would like to mention, uh, Open Up, which is a a collaboration, let's say, between 50 to 20 partners from Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, and Tunisia. We brought them together um, with, a, with the aim, let's say, to emancipate young people, to reinforce their social and economic autonomy through creativity. 
we would, as I said, we would like to show to young people that the creative sectors are really an option for, for their future, a viable option, an interesting option also for job creation um, and for personal development. And bringing these organizations together, the, the main fo focus at the moment is really peer-to-peer -peer learning exchange, knowledge development and knowledge transfer, and then small co collaboration, again, in the sense of leverage impact and reducing resources. So maybe just uh, to finish and as a last message in the sense of I do see coming from a, let's say, from an organization that collaborates a lot with different countries um, and different sectors, and also having uh, seen the challenges that a lot of our partners faced during these last months, that uh, there is huge potential to rethink these collaborations, to develop um, new methodologies in regard to structures, in regard to uh, the tools that we use. There is a huge potential in really thinking, why do we collaborate? What is, what is meaningful for us? What should be the goal of this co collaboration? Um, and there should also a focus, a shift maybe of focus, who are really my counterparts that are relevant? How shall I compose my collaboration? And maybe uh, go a bit away from the, the look towards Western Europe, uh, but looking around local, but also uh, to other, let's say, areas, very interesting areas in the world. Thank you, Mike. Great, thank you very much, Carol. Um, that sets lots of food for thought there as well. Um, and, and, and what is really nice about this, both you and Christos, is to have people who are on the other side, as it were, of making funds available in the room and to hear your perspectives, because quite often we kind of speak to each other um, and we talk about people like yourselves but you're not in the room. And it's fantastic to have you here for us to be able to engage with you and to hear firsthand what it is that you're thinking and how you're implementing things so that we can do um, things that are in accordance with, with, with that vision. Rania from Jordan is our final um, provocateur. Yes, hello everybody. And thank you so much for having me here. It's great to see Carol from Drosos who are supporting the National Center for Culture and Arts which is the organization I represent. Um, I'm also um, a senior program development manager, which means that I am also responsible for developing programs that go into sustaining our work in Jordan. Uh, the National Center for Culture and Arts uh, is part of King Hussein Foundation. Uh, and King Hussein Foundation is a foundation created uh, by Her Majesty Queen Noor, um, and it is to um, preserve the legacy of the late King Hussein. And um, we are also in uh, many spheres, working in many areas, health, culture, education, uh, uh, and music. So we're quite um, um, a melange of, of, of entities put together. Um, this also allows us to collaborate in many areas as well. Um, the fact that a lot of the um, uh, entities of the King Hussein Foundation are concerned with many areas uh, allows us to also collaborate locally uh, towards promoting health, towards involving the arts in education, uh, towards involving arts in, in bringing awareness to social issues. Um, also, um, we have managed to uh, integrate the arts in education uh, because, uh, you know, in a country like ours that uh, where resources are very limited, it is very important for us to be able to reach uh, sectors that don't have access to culture and so forth. Um, I was um, um, thinking about what um, uh, Carol said about crossing sectors, and this is very true in the National Center for Culture and Arts, because we try to integrate arts for social development and education, so that the, we can reach um, the widest um, um, audiences, including, for example, now our focus is on children in public schools that really have no access to art. So. Um, in partnership with Drosas, actually, we are now implementing a training program for teachers to be able to deliver 
comprehensive um, uh, art programs uh, to do with theater and education in their schools, which we feel is very important. And this is where also collaboration with uh, the government is very important. So for us, we have been able to collaborate very successfully with the Ministry of Education in allowing us to carry out this uh, comprehensive art program in the schools as part of their daily uh, school days. Um, the other hat that I wear is that I am the director of the Amman Contemporary Dance Festival, uh, which is part of Masahad Dance Network and involves uh, Lebanon, Palestine, used to involve Syria before the crisis and uh, Jordan. So we organize this festival. It's an annual festival. And um, it's the, I became part of the festival um, in 2008. And it has been quite a challenge to sustain it. Um, the National Center for Culture and Arts is self-sustainable, so we have to make sure that we have enough projects that will sustain our activities in the center. Um, and we rely for uh, the support of international donors, but also the support of local uh, authorities and the local, the, the private and public sector. Um, the, what I wanted to say about collaboration, and it was actually the first thing that came to mind following on Kara, is why are we collaborating? I mean, is it because you, is it because of the artistic sense that you're collaborating? Is it because the funding opportunity is great, so we're collaborating? Uh, so there are many questions. Is it personal? Do you want to have a personal contact with that person, that person, that specific artist that you um, kind of uh, feel uh, attached to? So it is, why are we collaborating? Um, and uh, also, what are uh, the other thing that came to mind is the um, uh, Alan Watts that said, what if money was no object? What would you do differently? What would you do similarly? So for us, it has been um, a combination of both, to be honest. So sometimes the funding, the access to funding drives our collaboration. And sometimes it is because of the value of the product that we are trying uh, to make. The other thing that we have noticed a lot in, uh, at ACDF and Masahat is actually um, that we were curating different programs for different uh, countries. So although it is like we are all in the Middle East and we are all very close together, uh, creating programs for Lebanon, who is, was much more avant-garde in its programming, was not the same as also programming for um, Jordan or Syria or Palestine. So we have to be very careful in how we program and how we can collaborate while programming different uh, artistic um, performances for each festival. So this has always been a challenge, uh, but we have been able to overcome it. We don't always share the same companies because sometimes it's too avant-garde for our audiences. Um, the, I wanted to talk about an experience that we had, which was a, a, a bit before its time. So in 2006, we had a project with dancers in Copenhagen, and it was actually uh, called the one-to-one -one project. And what was interesting about it is that it was um, online. So we created a dedicated website for these children to share their ideas, but only through dance and not through words. And then it became uh, a dedicated platform for young dancers to share their thoughts and ideas. And then uh, it became more hybrid because we uh, took these children to Copenhagen and they performed at the Royal Opera House. So we started long before using this technology to bring people together. Um, now, um, we've had to cancel, unfortunately, ACDF for 2020, but in 2021, we're also looking at alternative ways of holding this festival. Um, I know that it is uh, very um, now, basically what Carol said about structure and what Krista said about the quality of the work, we're trying to find a way to entice audiences to come to um, view a performance 
online while still experiencing um, the vibe and energy that you get in being in a theater. Um, so what we are trying to do now is to maybe have um, live stream the performances online, but also maybe have a Q&A with the artist or a Q&A with the dancers and artists so that there is more interaction uh, that makes you feel like you are physically in the theater or you are physically participating uh, in the event that you're seeing, which we think is very important because a lot of audiences that we've heard from have been saying that, you know, why don't I just watch it on YouTube? Why do I have to go in and watch this? And there has to be, I think, another way of reaching your audiences, um, not just by live streaming, even if the, you know, all the technical uh, qualities are fantastic, you still need that element to engage the audience. Uh, the other thing that we were thinking of doing was that um, to actually flip it on its head. So usually uh, the festivals invite artists over uh, from Europe, from the States to participate in festivals physically here. But now we were thinking that since we have a lot of dancers, local dancers, that are being trained in Italy, in Germany, uh, in France, how about that they actually uh, do the choreography with their dancers around them. And that way, it is bringing the, uh, the performances to, um, to Jordan, for example, but it's actually the motivation comes from a Jordanian artist living in Europe and not the other way around. So that's another way that we're thinking of tackling uh, the situation. Um, it's always been difficult to, to um, bring audiences to watch contemporary dance uh, because um, if, if from our perspective, from, uh, from the perspective of Jordanian public, they don't really understand what contemporary dance is supposed to be. So usually when we have a classical performance, a ballet performance, we have a full house. The minute that we go into a contemporary dance, uh, it becomes much more difficult to have audiences. So it's also a form of educating our audiences that uh, contemporary dance is uh, um, valuable and is a different form of expression. Uh, so that's another way of collaborating with um, schools, with uh, um, different um, artists to spread the word about how to bring audiences into our theater, which has also been very important. So now we're trying to uh, find alternative ways of holding our festival but while still maintaining its uh, integrity and authenticity, but also uh, trying to build an audience that would appreciate this experience because um, we don't want them to feel that, um, you know, you're watching something on screen and this is the end. We want them to be feel like an integral part of the performance where they have a say, they can ask questions, there's feedback for them. So basically, this is what we're trying to do uh, with ACDF. And I think there is um, a possibility now to definitely think outside of the box, to definitely think of alternative ways of broadcasting your art, and but in a way that can also still engage the audience and make them feel that they are part of the performance rather than just being observers on a screen. Um, I think this is it for me. Great, thanks, Rania. I just sent you a two-minute warning, and there you were, finishing yeah. off. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, thank you very much to Christos and Carol and Rania for those provocations. I think, as I said earlier, there's a lot for us to think about and to engage with. So I'd like to invite um, the participants to basically indicate if you have a question to ask, and we'll um, certainly refer those questions to our panelists. And in the meantime, until I see any hands or um, questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to maybe just throw out a couple of questions and maybe get, can just start with you, uh, Christos. In terms of the international collaborations that you have undertaken in the past, uh, particularly the ones um, within the Mediterranean region, um, are there particular countries that you focus on? Um, and, and are there criteria that you use to select the countries from which 
you invite audience, um, yeah, invite artists. In other words, to what extent does the work that you do as the NASA Center kind of comply with Greece's cultural diplomacy kind of initiatives, I suppose? Um, not not tremendously. I mean, our criteria is uh, our criteria are very much based on the on the work itself. In other words, we're, we know we have a program uh, that is uh, you know curator led, um, and you know within a specific program or a specific curatorial um, uh, direction perspective, um, you know we've been interested in identifying artists uh, from the Mediterranean and uh, uh, men and um, and elsewhere where obviously as well, uh, that have something interesting to contribute uh, to, this, uh, to, to this framework, this curatorial framework, aesthetic, uh, aesthetic political sometimes framework, because a lot of the things we do are somehow related to, to critical issues that we want to sort of bring into the public sphere through, uh, through art. Uh, so this has been the main uh, the, the, the main uh, region the main reason and also because we do very much believe uh, as Rania and Carol said as well uh, that we have to break out of the uh, European North American uh, let's say framework there's so much interesting work being produced uh, around the world uh, and it's absolutely essential that this comes into a, a dialogue with what we're producing here. Obviously, there have been countries that it's been uh, uh, we work most with. I mentioned Beirut and Lebanon. Uh, de very definitely, within MENA, um, most of our work has focused on uh, on uh, collaborations with artists and institutions from from Lebanon. And I would say, following that, um, Egypt um, uh, uh, second uh, secondly. Also, you know, unfortunately, uh, one has to say that. A very large percentage of uh, uh, contemporary artists, especially the more critical ones, um, are in a diaspora, um, and that therefore um, it's often not a question of working with a country, but working with artists who have left the country. This has particularly been the case, obviously, with Syrian artists, who we've done quite a bit of work with over the years. Um, it's, so, uh, yes, this, these are the, some I hope some responses to your question. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, a very, very good point that you've made. I, I wondered about um, the curatorial direction of your curators. How many, are your curators generally people living in Greece? Are they Greek? Um, are they people whom you might invite from different countries um, to play a curatorial role? Um, yes, I mean, obviously the core team uh, is in uh, Greece and uh, I think one of them, um, uh, Kosadinos Zathas is actually part of a workshop uh, that is being run within this framework that we're having today and yesterday. Um, but there have been and there are collaborations with uh, curators from uh, outside uh, Greece. Obviously, I mentioned, for example, um, I mentioned, for example, in the meeting point six, uh, which was uh, curated by Okuyen Wizor and uh, with the deep involvement of uh, Tarek El Fetou uh, as well. Um, as, and uh, similarly, there have been other experiences um, with the curators from outside Greece, not, not necessarily always from MENA region, of course. I mean, there have been people from Scandinavia as well, for example, or, or you know, Germany, Austria, uh, but also strong collaborations curatorially with people abroad. Yes, yeah, so that is also something we do. A question that came through Facebook from someone who's been watching, um, asking about the extent to which you might have been researching and anticipating a post-coronavirus era. Um, is the Onassis Foundation, in a sense, biding its time for the arts and culture situation to return to normal and then picking it up again? Or is the research being done about the impact of the coronavirus on the arts and culture um, milieu? And then is there a plan as to how to address that impact, particularly the adverse impacts? Well, we've actually been extremely active during the last 11, 12 months, um, but obviously we've been active in ways we could be. Um, so, uh, but I'll give an example, uh, a, a recent example. Um, each year we have uh, an event called the uh, Young Choreographers Festival, uh, or NASA's New Choreographers. So, uh, which um, uh, usually 
responds to proposals from an open call that we issue. So this year, for example, the open call uh, was specifically for, for works that would be entirely shown, presented through, uh, uh, through media on the internet. Um, so that's, for example, you know, one way. And we've done other things like that over the, over the year uh, as well. So one of the things that we have done is to try and, uh, to try and uh, stimulate work uh, that can be produced in an interesting manner within within this medium so that's one thing in terms of the post corona uh, uh, era uh, which we hope will soon be with us but uh, we don't know how soon um, obviously like everybody else uh, in the known universe we have a backlog of cancelled and productions oh. that we need to catch up with so you know unfortunately we're pretty much our schedule is pretty much full till the end of 2022 just to present what we didn't present in 2020, 2021. Uh, but we don't believe that we're going to stop uh, working uh, with these, uh, with the medium of the internet. I mean, I think, I think it's there uh, in many ways uh, to, to, to stay, uh, hopefully, obviously not to this degree. I mean, we're, we're, we're very attached to the physical performance space, uh, very much so. Um, but nonetheless, these formats are here to stay, and we intend to keep on cultivating. In, in some ways, you know, um, you know, as I said, it's not better than, but things have been done this year that wouldn't have been done otherwise. Uh, I mean, yeah. there's, you know, there's a possibility that even what we're doing today might not have happened so easily um, otherwise. Uh, you know, maybe people wouldn't be able to travel so much. And indeed, from an environmental perspective, which is also something that we're concerned with, uh, people maybe shouldn't travel as much as we did before, uh, before Corona. Um, so I would say that you know there, there are things to there, there are things to, to retain from this experience to learn to learn from it, um, and a lot of very important questions to, to answer related to it. Like for example, you know um, that I have yet to see a convincing um, a strategy for revenues uh, through the internet. Um, really. um, so you know there's it's not it's not it's not a panacea, uh, but there are things to learn from the experience. Yeah, um, just, just maybe one final question, um, Christos, before we move on to Carol. Uh, you made a very important point about how in this last uh, time, people have basically gone online to distribute their works. Um, and yet, not all of the work that has gone online has been necessarily of the quality that it has required. And I think many people are talking about um, what this period has shown is that there might very well be a new genre that emerges um, a genre of theater and dance, for example, made particularly for the internet. Um, you know, you get film and then you get theater and dance that have really been, the unique characteristic is the live interface between audience and performers. Now we are needing to create those works for the internet of online platforms, which is kind of quite different. And we've got, um, you know, audiences have so much else to access online that the production values are so much better than what we as dance and theater makers have been able to put online over the last while. I wondered about the extent to which the NASA Foundation might have anticipated that or is anticipating that and maybe investing in greater acquisition of skills on the part of the arts community to be able to present their work online. Well, Mike, you've made some very important points uh, in, in that question. There, there are several. I mean, you're quite right. Um, there is a skills issue uh, here. Uh, it, suddenly one needs you know an organization either needs to acquire internally or externally skills that it might not have had uh, uh, before and those are technical skills um, uh, in terms of how you actually record their broadcasting skills and i would add they're also skills uh, about the legalities the rights issues that are there i mean this is a, a new uh, something that many of us didn't have to think so much about before, but suddenly uh, questions of intellectual property rights and how you use them, how you distribute them, how you make use of them have become uh, very important. So that's definitely something. Um, of course, this does mean that once again, uh, we have, uh, let's say, a certain inequality in the field. I mean, the internet may be theoretically an open field, uh, but we all know it's not. Um, to start with, not everyone has internet access, not all age groups have the same internet access, not all geographies have the same internet access, so it's not an open 
field, it's not a level playing field. The second is, as you said, that the production values and the money you can pour into promoting make a tremendous difference. And here I think we've seen two very interesting let's say, opposite um, strategies. On the one hand, you have organizations who can really make super expensive, you know, really flashy productions that seamlessly work. On the other hand, you have a lot of people who've been working precisely with the glitch, uh, with the dirtiness of the Zoom interface or whatever, uh, and have made that actually part of the form uh, of, mm. of, of the work. That's another strategy that I think is, is definitely worth looking at. The third thing you mentioned is the question of the audience. And I think that one of the most stunning things that we've seen uh, about this whole uh, internet performance thing is the, the chat bar. <laughs> the, the chat actually is where it's happening. Uh, I think you know, when you go, to, you go to an online vernissage or even you go to an online concert, the action is in the chat room uh, where you know, people are speaking to each other. They're happy to see each other again in inverted commas. They're, it's really active. I mean, this is something that I think is uh, is has been a revelation you know, to me, at least. Um, uh, seeing seeing how how these events galvanize people to communicate amongst themselves. So yes, it's a it's a it's a it's a whole new world, and there's stuff to take and stuff to leave behind. <laughs> sure. Interesting point about uh, the chat box or the yeah. Um, a friend of mine is a stand-up comic. You know, he kind of went online. Um, and in his first concert, you know, stand-up comics, basically, it's very much about them interfacing with the audience and picking on the audience and having this kind of rapport. He went into a studio, was behind a camera, and couldn't really interface with his audience. And I think basically completely died as a stand-up comic. So there might be some forms that are much more able to make that kind of digital conversion than, than other forms. Um, I think, you know, with experience, they kind of got better at being able to look at what was happening online and people kind of holding up the questions or the comments from the audience for them to be able to respond to. But um, yeah, it has been a learning, learning curve for everyone. Carol, maybe um, maybe just to move on to you, could we start with, with, with Ryan's question to you? Um, how, in your view, can a first, what is the first step towards collaboration? I think you've alluded to it in your presentation, but maybe for Rand, if you could, um, I spelled it out a little bit more. Sorry. Uh, no, I actually think it, it, it's a very good question. And also looking at what uh, is going on at the moment, I think uh, one start could be also a discussion about uh, shifting the powers of collaboration. Um, I think in the past, very often, Branja mentioned it also, that uh, maybe you come together to access more easily funds. Uh, which is uh, absolutely justified, although not the best reason. <laughs> um, um, and then very often collaborations or ideas for collaboration are somehow uh, imposed or given by the ones who would fund it. And um, what we see also in the past is that actually the, the strong collaborations are really the ones that come together by the people who would like to, to collaborate and see a better, let's say an added value in this collaboration. So I think a, a good start for collaboration would also be in who kind of sets the framework of collaboration, who funds collaboration. And uh, that goes very much with the question about uh, power. Um, maybe also what um, showed a little bit uh, during the last months is that I think we collaborated even uh, we collaborated a lot before, let's say, COVID. Uh, we were really traveling around, maybe hopping from one festival to the other. Um, and the last months gave also space for really setting priorities and uh, taking a step back, time for reflection. And we saw that a lot with our partners. And uh, we were also trying to give them the space to stop a bit and really to reflect on what do they actually want to do and what is meaningful and what is really helpful. So in that sense, also as a thought, what is the start of a collaboration, maybe here to prioritize and be more, maybe a bit more selective um, than we used to be in, in, in the past. And um, 
looking also a bit, I am also a strong advocate of, let's say, physical performing space, as you said, Christos, I think physicality is important. And I think, for example, the Zoom discussions, they lack a little bit spontane spontaneity and um, everything that happens off the records when you meet, uh, but it also allows, and that's what we really saw, more exchange, people have more time for exchange and can exchange with other people, other actors they haven't thought of. Um, and at the end, it's also a better management of resources. And I think that is absolutely necessary that we have to rethink and discuss uh, resources in the future even more. So that would also go a bit back, what is a start, really see what resources do I have, or may maybe even what resources do I would like to, to use. Yeah, I think it also comes back to Rania's um, input earlier when she was saying the first step might very well be to ask why. Why we're collaborating? Yeah. Is it in order for us to access funds? Because in our own countries, we are not accessing funds, so we need to find funds elsewhere. So funds only become available from certain partners if you collaborate with partners from those other countries. And so that would be one reason. Another reason would be for aesthetic purposes, you feel that you might want to grow as an artist. And so you're looking to be challenged and to learn from others. Another reason might be that you need a market, you know, in your own country, people don't have disposable income to buy your works. And so you want to build your market, you want to tour, you want to travel. Um, so depending on how you answer those why questions, you would do the necessary research and the like, and, you know, do the kind of thing that you've just been referencing now. I wanted to ask you, and um, I'm not sure if it was a slip or, but, but in your, when you were talking about what you've done in, in Lebanon with the Solidarity Fund, you said that the implementing agencies, they're doing things very simply and very hierarchically. I was wondering if what you meant by hierarchical and why that was a good thing in that particular situation. I meant that in this particular situation, I really meant a very positive, these are two extraordinary organizations. Um, hierarchical in the sense that these two implementing organizations came together, developed, and let's say the idea, and are really taking the lead, while the three donors um, are very modest, also taking a step back, also in regard to monitoring or controlling them, etc. Uh, and in that sense, it's kind of a group or one person or one organization that really leads. And I think that's the strength there. It's a, it is an emergency situation. It is a situation that uh, is extremely difficult also to, to let's say, to spread funds and, and to implement uh, activities. You need a strong leadership and you need to act quickly. And in that sense, I think it's good if you have a, a clear leadership for such a collaboration. But it comes back to the questions why you are doing it. I think in other circumstances, when it's really more about peer-to-peer -peer learning, when it's more about uh, developing ideas, etc., then of course it's much better if you have a more horizontal structure sure. where people can really contribute. So yeah. I think that's why I said a bit in the sense of you have to ask why you are collaborating and then really mm. what's the right structure to collaborate. And depending mm. on that, you have to uh, go with it. Yeah that particular conditions demand particular kinds of responses. So it's not a one size fits all policy or Absolutely. strategy. Absolutely. It's about yes. what prevails yeah. at the time. And in fact, you mentioned um, Lebanon, obviously, and, and Omar from Zukak, he was with us last night making a presentation. One of the things that he mentioned was the difficulty that um, organizations and creatives in Lebanon are having in terms of accessing international funding because the current regime is kind of using it as a way of censorship where they are saying that because you're getting funding from outside you obviously are being funded by external parties to engage in regime change and the like and so therefore you're a threat to the state and as a consequence creatives are kind of finding great difficulty and engage in self-censorship and the like how are you kind of dealing or managing that in relation to partners that you might have in a place like lebanon we do face challenges or our partners face challenges in access and funds, yes, because there's a financial, economic, but also the banking sector is, is uh, not working well. 
Uh, so just getting, let's say, the funds, maybe you can transfer it, but then you cannot access it or you access it differently depending on the its exchange rates, etc., makes it extremely difficult for organizations to survive. Uh, absolutely. And it has an impact on the existence of many, many organizations, yes. Um, but it has also an impact on that organizations are forced to collaborate and get together. Uh, have to completely rethink their, uh, maybe not so maybe their mission, but let's say the organizational uh, model, have to rethink what it means uh, having a space, what it means to reach audiences. So the partners have to be extremely creative. And there are many wonderful examples, so very impressive examples. But it is a very difficult situation for the organizations there. What we try is really to support our partners um, exactly kind of to keep their basis. That is the organization, that is the team, um, if possible also the space um, or having a different space, but really having a little bit um, a space where they can go back, where they can rethink and from where they can kind of operate. But it's challenging, yes. Have, have you as Trussels kind of found um, any challenges politically from governments that are concerned about your funding creatives inside their country that may be critical of governments? Sorry, is that a question to Yeah, to yeah, to, 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 to you, Carol. Just again in the light, um, you know, Omar was talking about an artist who was assassinated recently in Lebanon and, and what this has really meant for many practitioners within the country, the fear that that has placed within them, but also the difficulty that they now have accessing funding from abroad because the government now sees them as being agents that are trying to bring about the change in government and they're funded from the outside. So the question was more, have you found any challenges in that regard? And does having the Solidarity Fund in Lebanon help to alleviate that in some ways? That in other words, you're not funding directly, you're funding through an internal agency. Uh, the Solidarity Fund goes also to, um, through two organizations that are locally based. So these are also two local organizations. Yeah. Uh, what makes it easier with our partnerships is if partners have a kind of a second uh, structure. So if they have uh, the local structure, but at the same time are registered maybe in another, another country, that makes it yeah. a little bit easier. Um, so far, happily in the sense of supporting our partners as much as we can, we haven't faced difficulties as an organization or let's say as a, as a donor. Um, however, our partners, as I said, they have difficulties to act, to perform, uh, to, to do their work. That, that's the case, yes. Yeah. There's a question from Femona uh, to you, Carol, in the chat. How can organizations or individuals be prepared to engage in solid collaborations? What are the upcoming innovative types of collaboration in addition to co-production, for example. She says it's to everyone on the panel. <laughs> Please, happy, happy for, for, for support in answering this, this question. Yeah. So, so Crystal, so Rania, if you, if there are other innovative ways in which collaboration um, is kind of happening at the moment, other than the traditional ways when people were able to physically travel and physically work together. Are there other ways in which these things are happening now, Rania? Uh, yes, uh, we're, we're, we're trying very hard. Um, we have, um, we're, what we're suggesting we're going to do is, for example, um, give a workshop to local dancers where they are in the theater physically, but the workshop artists will be conducting the artists from Europe, for example, as part of the SADF, have them on a big screen and see how they can deliver a workshop, for example, online. And the other forms of collaboration that we have been doing, and because of uh, the restrictions, for example, to do our uh, theater performances, is that um, 
uh, investing in a system where we can still engage with the audiences. So we now uh, present our uh, plays, but there's also, it's live, and there's also um, immediately the chance to engage directly with the uh, actors themselves. So that they, that we, we have, to us, it was very important to maintain that engagement. So yes, we are trying different ways to see how we can still keep that human feeling, if you like, and make sure it's still there. Since we have you speaking now, Rani, maybe a couple of questions. Um, so, so you were mentioning how um, you know your art center is obviously quite closely seem to be quite close to government in the sense that it's funded by government, it's there to perpetuate the legacy of King Hussein and the like. I wondered about the extent to which that close proximity to government might be a problem for you in terms of collaboration. Is it at all or is it that Jordan is seen as a more liberal society so that people don't mind that and because it has access to resources they are happy to collaborate with you? Well, actually, we're not a government organization. We're a non-governmental organization, non-for-profit organization. But uh, we learned early on that it is very, very important to make sure that we have good relationship and a good network uh, with the government sector because they are involved in many um, areas, obviously. Uh, so we have always been on the good side of government so that we want to assist them. Uh, so, for example, the, um, uh, the program that we are now implementing with Drosos, who, by the way, were one of the most valuable partners in this crisis, because other um, partners that we have, other donors that we have, we started asking questions about whether we will be able to deliver our programs. Drosos just offered support and mitigation. So that is great. But the idea of having the government on your side in a country like Jordan is very important. This is what has allowed us to go into schools, public schools. It has allowed us to integrate art in schools. Um, as you know, Jordan is, does not have the um, uh, funds to invest in culture. That's the last priority probably, I would say. Uh, it's been, you know, we've had the first wave of Iraqi refugees followed by the second wave of the Syrian refugees. So culture became kind of at the bottom of the ladder. It's the last priority. So actually it is, we feel that it is our job to step in as civil society and non-governmental organizations and support the government in delivering programs, especially if there is value to these programs. So if we want art to touch every child in Jordan, we have to take on the responsibility of collaborating with the government to make sure that we deliver art to every child in, in the public school sector, for example. Right, well, thanks for, thanks for clarifying that. Um, I wanted to, to maybe just continue um, talking a little bit about um, that association with government and the notion of freedom of expression, because obviously in terms of collaborations, you might get people from other parts of the world who are coming to Jordan to work with you and the like, are there things that you would not allow to be said on your platforms in case it alienates that relationship with government? Well, I think it's not only government, it's also your relationship with your audience. You know, you have to know who uh, your target audience is. Uh, for example, in Jordan, our audience is relatively conservative which means that, uh, you know, you can't bring, uh, for example, uh, you know, it's not even words for, for me in dance. I have to be very careful about what they're wearing and what is the context of their presentation. Because I think, although it is good to push the boundaries, you need to know the timing for pushing boundaries. So for example, my focus was on actually getting an audience for the Contemporary Dance Festival. So that feel people year after year felt more comfortable watching things out of the ordinary that they haven't really uh, seen before and slowly start to push boundaries and see how far we can go. But I think if you push boundaries from the get-go, you're gonna alienate your audiences. And it's not about censorship, it's about alienating your audiences. So I've tried it a few times. I've seen people walk out of the theater 
that's fine. You know, you try again. Uh, so you have to find a balance between pushing the boundaries and also maintaining a presence because at the end of the day, you know, the artists also don't want to uh, perform in front of a, an empty theater, no, you know, no. no audiences. So it's a quite a balance in our area. Uh, there's just one one other thing that I wanted to actually address to Rand, who was asking about how to commence. Just just before you do that, I just yes. wanted to say that the point that you're making is a very important one in terms of collaborations, because it's necessary for the partners to understand the political context in which they work. And it's not simply, you know, in some context, freedom of expression means one thing in another context. You know, it means that it needs to be practiced in a very different kind of context. And there needs to be some understanding of that on the part on the part of partners. So the importance of having this kind of engagement when we are working collaboratively in the way that we're talking about is to raise these things and to put them on the table so that people begin to understand mm -hmm. the limitations at times yeah. of collaboration as well. But please yeah. go ahead and, and address Rand's question. I, I just wanted to say to Rand, uh, because uh, I know she's very... Um, um, excited about uh, commencing her journey uh, in, in dance and collaborating. Um, I just wanted to say that usually the, the things that impede us from regional collaboration is usually funding. Because when you uh, collaborate with European, um, American, um, um, I don't know, Australian companies, they have a funding from their cultural institution and their government. So that usually facilitates collaboration a bit. When you want to collaborate with people in the region, in Palestine, Morocco, Tunisia, it's quite difficult because they don't have the funding. So it becomes, you need to now start uh, looking for funding for them to be able to attend, for example, festivals. So that's why uh, the collaboration in that, from that aspect, is easier with European American uh, companies. Thanks, Rania. Um, Carol, you wanted to come back to Hermona's question. Just maybe quickly, uh, very curious and also to hear the, the panel, but I think what we struck was the expression of solid collaborations. I think it's the word solid that made me thought a bit. Um, but Building also on what Rania said, I, I believe that collaborations take time. And uh, what uh, lately also uh, one of our partners told me is that uh, Drosos offers partners just space to come together without having kind of, uh, in that sense, asking a result or an output, but just offering space coming together to brainstorm. And I think solid and good collaborations need the, the time and the space just to brainstorm and to get to know each other. And then in particular, probably also in the arts sector, um, artists are very often, and I mean that in a very positive uh, way, individuals. They know what they want, they know what they would like to express, and that makes eventually collaborations uh, a bit more challenging. So there too, I think it needs, um, you have to get used to collaborations and you can start that with very modest ones. We don't have to think of co-productions at the first collaborations, but I think coming back also to that you have to have a local strong base locally, maybe there is a collaboration and just with the, the coffee shop in front of you. Maybe there is a collaboration with the kindergarten uh, in your community. But I think collaborations can start very small and very modest and don't have to be uh, always on a global level. Christina, what you, uh, uh, Carol, sorry, what you're referring to now, I was watching Christina's question in the chat and Christina, Carol, you know. Um, so I was, I was going to ask you, you mentioned that, and, and Christos also spoke about um, the need for more intersectoral kind of dialogue and collaboration that maybe arts people need to move beyond the art space and work with other sectors in society as well. I'm not sure if, if that's kind of what you're referring to, but I wanted to ask the question about that in relation to many people within the arts feel they are so marginalized already in terms of funding and the like. Now, that in order to access resources, they need to work with other, act, with other players. And so their art has been instrumentalized in order to access resources for them to be able to practice their art. Um, can there not just be art or funding made available for people to practice their art without them having to do all of that cross-sectoral collaboration? I'm playing devil's advocate here. 
that for? Yeah, go for it, Christos. So oh, okay. to the... Yeah, well, I think you know the instrumentalization of, of art is a big issue, uh, and it's lurking in the background of these intersectoral uh, um, collaborations. Uh, definitely, I mean, art, uh, especially in the in the Western uh, in Western Europe, art is being called upon uh, to somehow cure, uh, you know social ruptures uh, to cure exclusion to cure anything uh, that's there uh, that's been created by forces much more structural and deep uh, than than art itself so yes there is that on the other hand i think it's also fair to say that what art is over the last decades has evolved substantially i think we've moved to a degree away from the arts model where you have an artist producing a masterwork uh, and distributing it to the to the world. Uh, we've moved much closer to forms of collaboration which may or may not actually lead to a work but have a value in themselves. And we've moved to a world in which artists and the people they might work with from other sectors are looking to see what they can gain from uh, uh, you know, from this collaboration for their own sake, for their own art, for their own work. I mean, um, this is definitely the case. I can think of two sectors where, where this is definitely the, uh, the case. Uh, one is the collaboration between arts and science and technology, where the use of new materials, for example, has become a very important and use of new technologies is a very important part of many artists' uh, vocabularies. And we're working together with a tech company or a scientist researching, you know, nanomaterials or whatever it may be, um, provides provides inspiration and and uh, you know ground for further work for both. Another is obviously working uh, in in the education sector. I mean, you know, uh, there's a lot to be said for for you know partnerships between artists and researchers in various fields. A lot of art is research based these days. So I think. Yes, the danger of instrumentalization is definitely there. Uh, but on the other hand, art has changed as well. Um, it's not what it was. It's not the, the individual great artist producing a masterwork. I suppose the question could also be asked of artists. What is so bad about art being instrumentalized at times, if it is towards some kind of socially good end from time to time? For example, if one is using a piece of theatre to educate people about how not to get or how not to pass on the coronavirus. Is that not a good thing? If one has a music concert against xenophobia um, and in support of migrants and so on, is that not a good thing? In a way, it's an instrumentalization of the arts towards some kind of a socially good end, and artists are kind of benefiting in that. I, I, again, just yeah, kind of raising it as you know, the, the problem is uh, when <clears throat> when the when the ease, when these ends become metrics on which funding Absolutely. is based. So you know when Absolutely. you say that um, uh, you know okay you get funding if you can prove uh, that you have achieved X social metric, um, and that's you know it's I think that's where it starts getting tricky uh, a bit in terms sure. of uh, and. Also, when it's kind of imposed, when you know you feel you have to do this because otherwise you can't survive, um, then it starts becoming problematic. Uh, I think. Yep, um, it's it's interesting because in many ways the public sector, in order to address some of the major challenges that the public sector faces, such as for example the marginalisation of women, um, vulnerable children, the marginalisation of disabled people, often have those kinds of metrics built into access in public funding, certainly within our National Lottery Commission here, for example, those are very important criteria and I know artists tear their hair out about having to tick those boxes. And yet at the same time, one understands the political imperatives for it, although, as you were saying earlier, and I think you make a very valuable point, that other sectors in society that are much more resourced have not been able to address those metrics. And yet artists are kind of called upon somehow through their art to kind of take on those challenges and, and to make society better. But thank you for that. I just wanted to, Christos, uh, look at the question at Christina, um, asking about, um, you know, has the he been more in my environmentally sustainable? Can you elaborate on some of the steps taken to achieve this? Yeah, I can elaborate a, a bit because it's a long, it's a long story. And uh, uh, if you're interested, uh, I can certainly send some information about this uh, afterwards. 
Um, basically, the, the, what we've been trying to do is work at several levels at the same time. And the first step in any of this is to understand where you are environmentally, both in terms of your understanding of the challenges and also in terms of your footprint. So the first, the first thing that we do and the first thing that anyone has to do is actually understand where they are. The second thing that's really super important, obviously, is building up within an organization a culture uh, of environmental sensitivity and understanding what climate emergency means. Uh, so this involves a lot of internal work because without people changing the way they work, uh, this can't uh, this can't evolve. So we devote a lot of time uh, a lot of time to that. The third level is obviously tweaking the infrastructure, uh, which you can do either at a micro level, which is of also an usually very useful. You know how you know, how good are you at switching off lights when you don't need them? You know uh, how bad are you at wasting water? Blah 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 which is also often a question of culture, but it can also be mechanical before moving on to heavier duty things like sort of, can I afford a heat inverter, which you may or may not be able to, uh, to afford. So there's a tweaking the infrastructure. Another level, of course, is procedures, including procurement procedures. What do you buy? How important in your selection of what you buy as a service or a product is its environmental uh, footprint, as opposed to just price, for example? Uh, is that a real factor for you? Uh, so that procurement is super important as well. Procedures, um, the technical riders you develop, both for incoming and outgoing performances. Have you taken environmental factors into account in drawing up your rider? Do you have a green rider? Do you recycle scenography materials, et cetera, et cetera? I mean, there's an awful lot to do. Another level further on is how do you integrate all this into your programming? Do you find you attempt to reach out and work with artists who are in, concerned about climate uh, crisis, climate emergency, and what kind of forms do you develop to bring these, uh, these ideas and artworks to your stage? And the final level is how do you communicate about this? Because as we said earlier, arts organizations are basically big communicators. So how do you integrate this into your communication strategy so that you actually get people outside the arts world thinking about it as well? And on and on and on. It's, it's, a, very, yeah. it's a very rewarding, essential, uh, and multi-layered um, uh, um, aspect. So it's difficult to answer. You know, one, one would need a whole panel just for that. But anyway, those are a few, a few points. <laughs> Well, that's great. And it goes back to what you were talking about earlier, the intersectionality and the more we need to be embracing it because these things are so intersectional. <laughs> and in fact, maybe just to mention, Christina, that there is a panel a little bit later on climate change and festivals. Um, the, the Academy Festival Academy is putting together a series of toolkits around various themes, audience development, the use of IT within festivals and the like. And one of them has to do with climate change as well. So. Um, if you are interested, particularly in that area, make sure that that's one of the two panel discussions that you go to a bit later. Rodney, I just wanted to come back to you in terms of talking about um, audiences. You were saying that last year you weren't able to have the festival, um, and this year you're wanting to maybe go more online and then get your audiences to come and, and, and experience um, the festival online. I just wanted to, you know, you were talking about when artists are thinking about collaborations, they must ask those why questions. I was wondering whether any research had been done in your case amongst the audience. Um, why would they want to watch online? Because festivals are such particular experiences. People go to festivals precisely because of the physical encounter, precisely because it's like a shopping mall. You can have so many different experiences one under one roof. It's an atmosphere which simply cannot be replicated in other forms. Now we are saying to our audiences, actually, you know what, because of COVID, you need to come and watch us online. Have we done any research into whether audiences actually want that or not? Or is this just something that we are doing because that's where we are now inhabiting, uh, we, we are inhabiting that space? Um, we, have, we have done some research, but um, it's not very encouraging news because actually, um, the Jordanians don't see the value of watching something online. Um, um, and they will not be, like you said, there's a vibe and uh, energy in the air that cannot be replaced. So I um, now in uh, at ACDF, we're thinking of doing a bit of both, which means that uh, we have to give them this interaction with the artists. So we're thinking that we will now, we usually do our um, uh, festival in April, 
uh, but uh, on the 12th of April, there's always, uh, there's uh, Ramadan this year. So that means 12th of April to the 12th of May is not a very good season. So we're moving it to June to allow for on-site local performances. So that maybe our audiences can get a bit of both, uh, which means that they will be encouraged by seeing performances on the ground physically outdoor and we are allowed to, um, I think some audiences maybe a maximum of 20 to 50 but uh, we're hoping in the summer we will get better but I think so far uh, we haven't been able to sell the idea uh, to Jordanian audiences to go online um, I think this will take um, a bit of time and not only that m what I'm thinking now is even post-COVID era it's going to take audiences a long time to feel comfortable enough and safe enough to walk back into a theater and sit in close proximity with others. So I think we have to, we have to allow more time for our own audiences to develop that confidence. And it not, might not be as easy as, you know, switching on and off and on and off switch. I think it's gonna take some time for people to, um, to come back to accepting being in a theater in close proximity with others and feeling comfortable enough to enjoy a performance. So I think it's a bit of a more long term, I'm thinking, than, than, than you know, next year, okay, it's over, let's go back. Oh. Yeah, and I think that what you describe is not peculiar to Jordan. I think many of us across all of our countries are going to experience exactly that. Um, audiences are not yet ready or they don't see, you know, to, to, to occupy the online space is not something that they're particularly keen on doing. And when they do go back, they might have over the last 10 months become so used to doing other things that we're going to have to work extra hard in the festival, theatre, art space to draw our audiences back uh, to our spaces. And, and it's, it's about finding a way to intrigue them enough to attend. You know, what, mm -hmm. is, the, what is it that we can offer? where it is intriguing for them to attend. That's why I was suggesting, for example, could we have a Q&A with a choreographer after the performance so that people can engage with them and, and feel like they're a bit more involved. I think um, a lot of people are going to feel very alienated being just watching um, you know, live streaming of a performance without any interaction whatsoever. And also yeah, there's, a, there's, a, there's a thing of making them pay for it. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you know? well, maybe maybe we're gonna have to do things, maybe we're gonna have to do things like buy a ticket to this show and get a free vaccination. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's, a, there's a final question here from Yusuf uh, from Morocco. There are many types of collaboration in the creative sector and a great need for developing ideas that break the cycle and engage stakeholders with new methodologies an interdisciplinary met, uh, project. The question here is how can we work together with different partners in a project that helps them to grow and generate new additions for the same project? Please share, share some inspirational sources. Anybody like to tackle that? Christoph? Well, I think he's uh, he's right um, that you know, there's too much one-offness in the arts world. You know, we work for the premiere, and then that's it. And uh, uh, so there's definitely uh, there's definitely a point there. Uh, how can we how can we make this? Uh, how can we get out of that? I think it's a question of you know of formats. I mean, there are formats that enable uh, kinds of uh, uh, participation and collaboration that are, can be more ongoing. Uh, and they're not necessarily, uh, uh, you know, ones that are uh, universally valid. But I, I mentioned earlier, for example, uh, at the platform we developed uh, uh, called Movement Radio. I'll just share the link uh, in the chat, uh, which has enabled us to, to work with a, a vastly larger number of people over time because these are collaborations that last <clears throat> a year or something. So it's uh, it, it's been good. Uh, I think another thing that's been uh, becoming more and more uh, common, and I think it's for the, precisely the reason that motivates the question, are obviously residencies. I mean, we've seen a vast increase in the numbers of residency projects uh, that have ha have come up over the over the last years. I think why people are interested in residency so much is that it does somehow 
somehow obviate uh, the fixation on on you know the the performance, the premiere. It, it it's an, a process based uh, um, uh, format, um, and that's uh, that's I think important too. But no doubt there are several you know there, there are vast numbers of things that one can think of that would just would be more evolutionary and collaborative. But it's a very it's a very important point and a very good question. It actually goes to your point about um, addressing mitigating climate change as well, that as opposed to doing one project here and then moving on, it's about developing a project over a period of time, so certainly. Well, Christos and Carol and Rania, you've been fantastic. Thank you very much for the inputs that you've provided and for engaging the questions that have come your way. Um, it's really been fantastic. And thank you for your generosity as well in terms of making your emails available for people to be able to follow up with you. Uh, subsequent to this, I hope that that's okay. Um, yes, yes, please and, uh, feel free to write, um, and if I can, I'll be happy to get back to you. Uh, yeah, thank you for the invitation as well. Thank you, thank you, and thank you on behalf of everyone who's here as a participant. It's been great having you, and we shall see you at an, on another occasion. But for now, uh, this is done. Thank you, and um, maybe over to Inga. Just to just to say very briefly, we still obviously have some time before one o'clock. But we wanted to create some time as well for ongoing one-on-ones, the networking element of the atelier. Although it's on Zoom, we still want people to be able to meet each other and network with each other. So Katie will facilitate your going into rooms and meeting one-on-one -on -one, uh, for the next 20 minutes or so. But Inga, over to you to finalize and basically end the panel. Yeah, so thank you to all the speakers, of course, and uh, also thank you to the audiences who have been following us on Facebook or other uh, means. So um, I guess the live stream can close here and we can continue, of course, with our program for all those who are directly uh, included into this. Uh, so as Mike said, we want to facilitate now another one-on-one. -on -one. Katie is ready for that. Um, so it's again, we go into a five minutes where you can meet somebody and we will meet shortly with the speakers and the mentors also in one group to prepare for um, the next uh, sessions this afternoon, if that is fine. So Katie, Scotty, beam us up. Here we go. Go to your rooms, everyone. <laughs>